Now let's introduce the concept of pulse shaping and Nyquist criteria for zero ISI, for zero intersymbol interference. Uh, we will look at the thing, the raised cosine, the, the concepts of excess bandwidth, and the role of factor. So those are the four terminologies you'll get used to. Sync, raised cosine, excess bandwidth, and role of factor. All right, so before we go into the details, let's make sure that the concept, some basic signals and systems concepts are clear. What you see here in front of you is a system. Okay. This system has an input, and then the input is small x of t in time. The output is y of t. The, in time domain, we represent the system using the impulse response. In the frequency domain, we can use capital X of f or of omega. This is the free transform of the input signal, and you get the output capital Y of f. So sometimes we're given the input in time or input in frequency, and we would like to get the output in time or output in frequency. At other times, what we have at the input is the power spectral density. So it's not the signal itself in frequency, it's not the spectrum, it's rather the power distribution. It's how the power is being distributed. For example, the axis would be frequency, and then this is the density of power. It tells you where is the power at high frequency, low frequency, where is the power is concentrated. And if you want to find the power in a certain band, what you do is you integrate. So this is called power density because it's a power spectral density because it shows you the power at different components of the frequency. So at times we're given the input power spectral density, how is the power is distributed? And we want to find the output power spectral density. The relation in the three cases, time or frequency or power spectral density is the following. In time, the output is equal to the convolution between the input and the, imp and the system, and the impulse response of the system. In frequency, it's equal to the multiplication. And the power is usually related to the square of the amplitude. So the, the output power spectral density equal to the input power spectral density multiplied by the square of the transfer function or the square of the amplitude of the transfer function, the magnitude of the transfer function. So it's very important not to get confused. Here we multiply by square because we are looking at the power of the output signal. This is needed to understand what's coming next. Now, in our case, we started with zeros and ones. Okay, we started with zeros and ones at the output of the PCM. Now, before we go to transmission, we need to know how do we represent this? So the first stage was the line coding. The line coding will give you the ones and zeros like you see here as changes. Are we changing in the middle, at the end? Are we going positive, negative? So to go from zeros and ones when to changes on the, on, on the signal, we're, do, we're using a specific line code. So some of them, there's only change to positive if there is ones, some if there is new. Remember, we have the on off. You can see the video before. There we use square uh, pulses for simplicity. But what the line code does, in fact, is shows you where to do the change. Then, well, of course, we cannot send impulses because they require infinite bandwidth. We will send this through the filter. So this green signal here shown, okay, is what goes in the input. The impulse response of the pulse shaping filter, I'm just showing here a square as an example. Then the output of this, at every impulse, you'll get the impulse response. So if you convolve this with that, you get the output, which is y of t. Have we changed this pulse shape? I will get combinations with, of different pulse, pulses. If this was triangle or any other signal, I will get the combination here. So this is coming from the data, and this is coming from the data and then the line code, and then this, this is coming from the pulse shape. Which pulse shape do we take? Now, this is the output signal. What, is, what determines the spectrum of this signal? What determines the spectrum is the combination of the line code, the data first, the line code, and the pulse that we choose. The pulse has a dominant impact on what the spectrum is. So we'll spend some time to, to study what is the best pulse shape that we have uh, to use. We have seen line codes, we have seen their advantage, disadvantage, and it's time to look at what pulse shaping is. 
Okay, so here, to understand what's going on, okay, here we have the pulse shaving filter, which we would like to design. This is the incoming sequence out of the line coder, zeros and ones and impulses. And this is the Y of T, this is the pulse shape sequence. To know how to design this, we need to know what happens next. What happens next is that whatever we design is going to go through the channel. And the channel is band limited to a given bandwidth. We call, let's say B sub C, C to stand for the channel. We can represent the channel in time as C of T, small c of T, or as a capital C of F or C of omega as a transfer function. Now, what the receiver is going to see is the output of this channel. Because this is band limited, whatever we put here must be either band limited within the channel capability, so it's going to pass, or the channel is going to filter out some component of the incoming sequence. So at this stage, from here to here, we can say the power spectral density of the shaped signal is going to go through the filter, so we have squared because of the power, to get the received power spectral density. Okay, now what we are saying is that this condition must, must be met. Whatever pulse shape we choose, it should fit inside the channel. So if you have a bandwidth of 1000 kilohertz, then we should try to shape the pulse here to have a bandwidth which is less than or equal to 1000 kilohertz. For signals, for a signal to be transmitted properly through a channel, the bandwidth of the channel must be at least as much as the bandwidth of, of the signal. We can say it another way. We can say the bandwidth of, of the signal, Y of T, must be less than the bandwidth of the channel. It's just the same thing. What if this is not true? If this is not true, we'll get a trouble and this trouble is called intersymbol interference, or in short, ISI. ISI stands for intersymbol interference. Okay, in the following slide, we see uh, the demonstration of the ISI problem. Let's start from the left here. Here, we have the sequence of the incoming data being line coded. I am using colors here to show you that the first information is up, then down, then up, we're using red, blue, green, and then CN, and then it goes through the pulse shaving filter. If you have chosen a square pulse shape, like we sometimes draw for simplicity, you'll find out that if you convolve, you get the following. In, in place of every impulse, you get the impulse response. So this is what you get. Now, recall that this is made the bandwidth of this depends on many things. It depends on the sequence, zeros and ones, the line code, and the pulse that we have chosen. Since the, the data itself is uh, random, sometimes it could be positive and negative, we we'll only focus on what we know. What we know is that what is the spectrum of the pulse shape, and we assume that things will average out. So you know, remember that the full transform is of rect is uh, sync. And then, of course, you just take the magnitude, you got the following distribution, something like sync squared or sync, and you just take the positive side. So how much is the bandwidth here? It's clearly the bandwidth is infinity. And if you take this signal through the filter here, which is band limited to BC, of course, part of the signal will just be out. Part of the signal will be filtered out, and we get the following we get some cut, some low pass filtering effect on, on the received signal. Okay, once you filter, what, if you can go from here back to time, you know that this is give you a square, but if you go now to time after cutting the tail of the spectrum, you will get, you'll get the following shape. You can see here that the symbol duration or the signal that was limited, the pulse that was limited to a certain time duration, TS, or TB is now not any more time limited. Remember, in signals and system, we say that any band limited signal is time unlimited. So what happens now, every pulse, every symbol is going to overlap with the other. It's going to interfere with the other. Of course, we are showing the colors here, but what you get, in fact, is the 
superposition you get the voltage of all so this voltage here will be affected by these tails here this phenomena of pulses expanding from their limited time and interfering with with the neighboring uh, pulses is called intersymbol interference so this is to demonstrate the intersymbol interference or ISI now to summarize what we have said we have shown you previous waveforms or line codes with pulses made of rectangular pulse shapes this is just to make things simple otherwise the use of uh, pulses creates a lot of troubles because pulses require bandwidth and as you can see here in the diagram below you, see, you can see that if you start with this going through a band limited channel being a cable or fiber optics or whatever you're not going to get exact squares you'll get a pulse smearing into the neighboring pulses it takes more time than what it is supposed to do and this is what we call inter symbol interference now the problem shows clearly if you are sending a sequence of high low high low then this is going to interfere with each other and instead of of getting the high as high and low as low you might mistakenly decide that this is high when it was originally being low because the neighboring cells are high and they are interfering with the, with the current pulse now how do we solve this problem we can solve it by applying nyquist criteria for zero isi remember there's nyquist sampling theorem and we also call this nyquist criteria for zero isi it's very logical but we are giving the name for credit so we have we're calling it um, nyquist criteria for zero isi i will start with the time domain uh, i'm showing you here a sequence of data okay and this is the time index and i would like to send zeros and ones and this is the bit duration or the symbol duration okay so Nyquist says if you want to send a pulse here you cannot time limit it to a certain time span because if it's time limited it's going to be bandwidth unlimited so what's the solution what he says okay it's okay to have the pulse here to represent your pulse by a positive or negative and you're not going to have a time limited so what you do is you don't interfere with the next pulses you make it pass by zero so although you have infinite time but the impact on the next impulses uh, on the next pulses or symbols is going to be zero okay so mathematically he's saying okay let's say that tb is the separation between successive symbols or pulses now when you use binary okay we'll see later on that every symbol equal to one bit so the time between every symbol and another or bit and another is tb and as you can see it's inversely proportional to the frequency so it's inversely proportional to the frequency or the rate what's rb it's the data rate how many bits per second do you have and what's tb it's the time for every bit so remember that frequency and time duration on period are uh, inversely related you can see that the time axis is marked at multiples of this bit duration so Nyquist says if you don't want to have ice i make sure that if, if for example you are sending one it should be one only during the bit of interest let's say here n zero this is our bit and it should be zero otherwise for all values of n an example of this is the following if you use the following pulse shape it's accepted it's give you zero ice i although it's it has long tail but at the bit of interest we're sending one and notes here it always pass by zero for the next so they don't interfere. remember in digital communication we just are interested in making decisions at discrete time intervals so this is a zero this is a zero this is a time criteria or the nyquist criteria for zero si in time domain of course uh, using this shape is just for demonstration we will show later on that the best shape that does this with the minimum required bandwidth because there are lots of options somebody might say i want to use the following shape whatever as long as it passed by zero you have no problem because this is a zero isi example but the best one that does this is the sync signal with the following specific uh, 
argument this sync signal if allow me it's going to give you you can see here it's going to give you um, just take this thing out okay it's going to give you the best of all so sync if you're going to send sync and it's going to pass by zero it does the same job and it requires the minimum bandwidth because there is no sharp edges so this is the conclusion and we'll see more details as we go on the conclusion is the sync don't sync squares don't sync squares send sync pulses okay and i'm showing you these dotted lines shows you the next sync if this is one and then sending one and then sending zero we have no problem because they are all there's all always no inter symbol interference there is a tail but at the duration at the instant of interest they always pass by zero now we want to see this nyquist criteria in, the, in time domain this will require some derivation so please focus with me now the sampled pulse okay we always refer to sampled signal by uh, we have been referring to sampled signal with a bar so the pulse when sampled okay sampling is like multiplying <coughs> sorry the pulse by a train of deltas and pulses and if if it has zero isi you should get only one delta all other samples should be zero okay now the full transform of both sides so this is representing nyquist criteria in a multiplication expression for the left hand side we have seen if you go back to our sampling video we have seen that a sampled signal has a spectrum which is the same as the spectrum of the original signal shifted to the right and to the left at multiples of the sampling frequency and scaled by the sampling frequency or one over the sampling period so this is something we have proved this is going to translate it to this full transform of the right hand side delta give you a constant one remember that rb and one over tb are related by the following now of course you have no problem if, if there is a scaling factor if this was five delta or ten delta or whatever we just want to have only one delta and everything else should be zero now what we're going to get here if you multiply both sides by tb you get the following expression this is the same as zero uh, nyquist criteria in time domain we have translated things in the frequency domain so if if yours if your pulse gives zero si it should satisfy this condition what does this condition says uh, in a way for a pulse spectrum this is not the pulse this is rather the spectrum of the pulse now if you want a pulse that gives you zero si its spectrum should have the following if shifted to the right and to the left and summed up i should get a constant so this is a possibility for this pulse shape if we shift to the following frequencies we can make it in a way that this term added up to this term and we get a constant if this is possible then we call it a nyquist criteria for zero si and frequency domain this is not always true because for example for the following pulse shape and for the following spectrum of a pulse shape okay there is no way that you can make a shift and you get constant because you know if you make shift to the right or to the left you're not going to get a constant value because of the irregular shape here so if you make this shift the result will not be some will not sum up to a constant for other cases we're going to show it's possible for example if you have this shape the answer is yes if we shift um, to the following frequencies so, and then we have the next shift and so on we can make it sum up to a constant so in the box here is what we call nyquist criteria for zero si so this is a very important box this is the criteria uh, you, you don't have to remember that you, you can just think of what is the pulse shape if shifted to the right or to the left give you a constant equal to tb by the way as a scaling factor is not a problem because all we are doing is scaling the original delta okay now we demonstrate uh, some examples of zero isi pulses this is the sync pulse 
its spectrum is like this. You can clearly see that if we shift to the right and to the left, if we shift to TB, I, will, I can make things look like a constant here. And luckily, this is going to give you RB over 2. So sync is the pulse that gives you 0 SI with the minimum required bandwidth, which is uh, uh, RB over 2. To get a constant without an overlap, you should have a constant here, and it should give you a sync pulse. The pulse that has a bandwidth RB over 2, which means if you have 1 kilobit per second, you need only half kilohertz. If you have 1 megabit per second, you need only a pulse width of 500k is the, the sync pulse. Therefore, the minimum channel bandwidth required for the transmission is always RB over 2. Now, there are some features for the sync. The sync pulse has the minimum required bandwidth among pulses satisfying Nyquist criteria. If you are looking for the minimum bandwidth, then it is there, it's the sync. However, there are a few problems with the sync. If you look at the diagram here on the side, the sync decays at a rate of 1 over t or 1 over n. Remember that sync x can be written as sine x over x. So, or sync t equal to sine t over t. So, it's like sine t multiplied by a scaling of 1 over t. There is a, there is a decay of 1 over t. So this is a signal and it decays with time at a rate of 1 over t. Now in real life I will not be I will not be able to sample exactly at the time of interest. So usually there is something called time jitter. Time jitter is kind of error in the time. So if you sample exactly here you get 0 SI. But because of time jitter I might be sampling a little bit to the right and to the left. For example, I'm just showing this for demo. If you sample at this instant, there will be some really very large tail for the other signals. And they are going, instead of reading this positive, you have to subtract these values from there. And you get a dominant value which is much lower than what you want. So we usually prefer small tail. We don't want large. This is what we call the tail. This is the tail. If this was small, okay, and that would be uh, more appreciated. So why do we care about the tail? Because there is time jitter. If there was no time jitter, I will always get zero. Okay. Now, there is another set of uh, solutions. Instead of using the sink, we're going to look at a set called raised cosine, okay, which satisfies Nyquist's criteria with smaller tail but we will pay the price in terms of bandwidth. And this is what we're going to do next. All right, now due to the limitations with the sink, we're going to introduce another family of curves called the raised cosine. Now, the sink itself will be one member of this family. What you see in the upper curve is the frequency response and the equivalent time, the color matches together. So for the blue spectrum, this is the minimum required bandwidth, which is 1 over 2t, or half the data rate. And the associated signal is this blue signal, the sync. And you can see it has the largest possible tail. That was the disadvantage. So what we're going to do, we allow the spectrum to be larger. We'll allow the spectrum to be more than the minimum. And the advantage we get, we get less tail. So you can go from blue to red to purple color and then for green. The green requires the highest possible bandwidth, which is now equal to RB. So we have here, we have RB over 2, and here we have RB. So we, we are using double the bandwidth, but the advantage, we have the minimum tail. If you look at the lower side sketch, we have the minimum required tail. And also we have some additional zero crossing, as you can see here in the diagram. We have some additional zero crossings. Those zero crossings will help in synchronization. To summarize, the family of curves, which is called the raised cosine, they allow you to trade off bandwidth for, uh, for smaller tail. Now, on the right-hand side, I am showing you an example of a curve which has... Uh, now, we have 
information one one zero one one zero whatever now we replace every one of them by uh, sink or by by raised cosine and then we add them up to get the curve so either you get the red curve or you get the blue curve what's the difference between the two one of them is the red curve and one is the blue curve one of them is using we are using r which is a measure of how much extra bandwidth we are, we are getting so the blue curve r equal to zero and here we have r equal to one r equal to zero means we are sending raised cosine we'll define what r is in the next slide r equal to one is the extreme case so if you look at this curve which one requires more bandwidth the blue or the red signal which one has 0.2 which one has 0.5 you can see clearly see here that the red signal has more overshot okay so it requires less bandwidth but it has more tail so you can think of this as being 0.2 and the blue signal is usually is the one that has r equal to 0.5 note here i'm writing beta and here r beta and r is the same thing some textbooks some references some authors they refer to this as r and some refer, refer to it as beta we'll define this formally in the next slide as i said 0.2 is the red curve and 0.5 is the blue curve now mathematically uh, mathematically we are representing the raised cosine i'm just showing you half of the spectrum it has three parts one part clearly zero Another part is clearly one constant, and this part is uh, the transition part. It, it is centered around Rb over 2, and we have some extra bandwidth. We call this the excess bandwidth from Rb over 2 plus Fx uh, to Rb over 2 plus Fx. This is called excess bandwidth. So what's Fx is the excess bandwidth. It's the extra bandwidth. It's defi it defines how much bandwidth is required. If Fx was equal to 0, we'll get sync remember that these are symmetric whatever you have here you have the opposite here and this is why because it satisfies nyquist criteria later on if you decide to sketch the image they will add up to a constant okay now this expression for the signal here on this tail is given by the red part of the signal we call it raised cosine it's like a sine but raised up shifted okay and this we call it raised cosine and this defines the limit okay so from 0 up to rb over 2 minus fx of course this is a double-sided spectrum but just sketch itself is just showing one side of the spectrum okay so this is the math expression we don't need to memorize it just we need to know what it means i'm using color code to show you that uh, which is which is blue and which is red and which is the uh, black part of the signal okay i'll move uh, as i said this raised cosine family satisfies nyquist criteria and if you shift to the proper frequency you can get a constant value okay now in this slide as the title suggests we look at the extreme cases the extreme cases we're going to define r to be the role of factor what's the role of factor it's how much extra bandwidth fx compared with the minimum required bandwidth so r equal to fx the extra bandwidth divide by rb over 2 which is the minimum required bandwidth or you can say it's 2 divided by 2fx divided by rb this is a measurement of how much bandwidth we are getting this is called the role of factor it says how things are being rolled off if r equal to zero we get the red curve if r equal to one i get the blue curve these are the extreme cases remember that okay things earlier in life are, are approximated because whatever pulse shape you are designing when it get, when it gets transmitted it's going to change shape as it travels now that we have said we come up with a very important formula that says what is the minimum required bandwidth for transmission for baseband the bandwidth equal to rb over 2 this is the minimum plus an additional excess bandwidth which is equal to rb over 2 you can come up with this equation 
the extra bandwidth if you solve for fx from here you'll find that fx equal to r times rb divided by 2 so please remember this equation you can always write it this way it's equal to 1 plus the rule of factor times rb over 2 so if r equal to 0 we get the minimum required bandwidth and if r equal to 1 we get the maximum possible bandwidth which is rb now there is cosine for the case for one of the extreme cases where we have the full rule of factor r equal to 1 we get uh, the following expression now remember these equations that we had before i'm just going to look at one scenario well, I will just take the, the maximum possible bandwidth so that we don't have this anymore because it's going to roll off, to roll off in, in, uh, from the beginning and I got the following expression so if you find this equation of course the extra bandwidth will be RB over 2 this is the extreme case so what we have here on the side don't get confused this is the equation generic for any raised cosine with any value of R if it's only R equal to 1 you can combine this expression into just one and you got the following expression okay this is the this is the expression here the red one and we're using by just to limit okay instead of saying there is there are limits i'm using the direct function to limit the pulse width okay and of course we can find the time domain equivalent and time domain again if you do every switch transform you find, you find this this is called raised cosine but this is kind of the other extreme we have sync at one extreme and we have the full roll of factor at one ex at the other extreme okay so this requires maybe sometime you get back and pause the video and take it slowly remember that these funk expressions are not meant to be memorized we just need to know how and what they mean exercise now let's practice together it says compare compared to a sync pulse the raised cosine pulse with full roll factor r equal to one has the advantage of okay compared with cosine with sync what is the advantage of for raised cosine why did we require more bandwidth less transmitted power less bandwidth oh, this is clearly wrong faster rate of decay less dc value all of the above clearly the best answer is faster rate of decay the reason we're paying the price of bandwidth is the fast rate of decay now it says data at a rate of 7 kilobits per second is to be transmitted over a baseband channel of bandwidth 4 kilohertz using Nyquist criteria pulses determine the maximum value of the roll of factor r that can be used we had one main equation remember we have r or sorry the bandwidth the bandwidth equal to 1 plus r times uh, rb over 2 we're giving the data rate 7 kilobit per second divide by 2 you get 3.2 okay so this is going to be the bandwidth multiplied by 2 divided by rb minus 1 will give you the value of r so the bandwidth is 4 8 divided by 7 so this is equal to 2 times the bandwidth which is 4k divided by 7k minus 1 so this is 8 over 7 minus 1 which is 1 over 7 this is this is supposed to be the correct answer so we have one major equation now now finally it says is it possible to design a system with zero isi and symbol rate greater than twice the bandwidth this is impossible you cannot create a six system with more than double the bandwidth so if you are given a bandwidth that's it the maximum rate is defined if you want to get zero isi if you don't have zero isi then of course you can the reason is that once remember the criteria for zero isi we want the sum let's say that this is the spectrum of a pulse whatever the spectrum is the moment you shift to more than double the bandwidth 
you get disconnected images and there is no way you can satisfy Nyquist criteria in frequency domain there is no way they can add up to, con to constant because we have a gap here all right now the next uh, slide will have more questions some more exercises I leave the answer for you here please uh, write your answers down in the comment section it says a least telephone line of bandwidth 3 kilohertz is used to transmit binary pulses calculate the data rate so this is the bandwidth is given calculate the data rate in bits per second that can be transmitted if we use baseband communication with rollout factor r equal to 0.25 remember the equation we had the same equation bandwidth equals to 1 plus r times rb over 2 now this time he's asking for uh, rb a binary data is to be transmitted using baseband binary transmission with the pulse shape having the spectrum shown in the figure what is the transmission rate that results in zero si explain how we got it okay now basically of course remember we have the other image here i'm just not showing it for simplicity the question is can you find a frequency if we shift this image to we'll get a constant okay of course you need something like this right so you need to know what is the frequency that if you shift to you can get the sketch to have a constant what is the value write it down in the comments now the, the last one is somehow similar it says a pulse p of t whose spectrum p of f is shown in the figure this figure and we're giving you the value of f1 and f2 okay determine the maximum rate at which binary data can be transmitted by this pulse using Nyquist criteria what is the role of factor You're asking for two things okay first you need to find what is the frequency that you need to shift to remember the shape has to be like this otherwise so that we get a constant what is this frequency that we have to shift to and once you find the frequency all right you know that this is the minimum required bandwidth and how much extra we have and you can find the role of factor Please share your answers down and uh, let's see if the, our answers are the same and if we can justify them. Good luck.